Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie Marischal. I'm a senior policy analyst at Ranking Digital Rights. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you today for this fireside chat uh, with uh, Shoshana Zuboff, Chris Gilliard, and Joe Westby on real corporate accountability for surveillance capitalism, civil society's agenda for a new decade. Uh, so you're able to, I believe you're able to see our speaker bios uh, through the platform. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll let you to read that on your own. Uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, let's go to Shoshana first. Uh, so Shoshana, of course, uh, is a professor uh, emerita at the Harvard Business School and author of The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. So Shoshana, for people who may not have had a chance to read your book yet, or maybe aren't familiar with the intellectual framework uh, that you describe in the book, could you give us a brief overview of the age of surveillance capitalism? Well, we seem to be having an audio issue on Shoshana's end uh, again. So while, uh, while Shoshana uh, uh, deals with her technical issue, um, let's, uh, let's take a step back maybe and talk about uh, the context in which we're having this conversation. Uh, of course, we're all having this conversation uh, online via a series of, um, of, of technical and uh, internet intermediaries, uh, many of which are, as we speak about the very problem itself, are in the process of uh, recording and tracking and eventually analyzing uh, everything that we're doing right now. Uh, everything from our IP addresses to what other browser, what browsers we're using, what other tools we're using at the same time. Uh, and all this, uh, according to uh, the, the framework of surveillance capitalism, in order to not only uh, target us with ads and justify charging advertisers and brands uh, for the privilege of uh, reaching our attention, but also for, uh, for the purpose of uh, behavior modification, of nudging all of us to take actions that um, in these platforms estimation uh, will benefit their bottom line in the long, uh, short and medium term. So um, I, I'm told that uh, the audio is back. So uh, Shoshana, uh, can oh, we turn to okay. you for an overview of your book? Can you hear me now? Yes, I yes. can, thanks so much. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for stepping into the fray there, Natalie. It's, it's always something. And I bet everybody who's watching us understands exactly what that means. OK, so um, I'll just uh, build really quickly on, on some of the pieces that Natalie laid out. Surveillance capitalism begins with uh, an audacious, unexpected, startling and dark discovery that after all the things that capitalism has commoditized over the centuries, turning them into stuff that could be sold and purchased, in the early 2000s, and it happened at Google, and it happened under a state of financial emergency during the dot-com bust, what they discovered was that private human experience, what we do in our own lives, our behavior, our experience, could be taken without our knowledge, which is to say it could be stolen. It could be translated into behavioral data, behavioral data claimed as zero cost proprietary assets. Those behavioral data travel through supply chains, data flows into a 21st century factory. We call it artificial intelligence. This computational factory, like every factory makes products their prediction products, what it produces, are predictions of our behavior soon and later, individual group populations. Those predictions are sold into a new kind of marketplace. I call them human futures markets because they trade exclusively in bets on what we will do. Now, the first human futures markets were, as we all know, online advertising where they were buying a prediction product called the click-through rate. The trillion dollar capitalization of Google, uh, the near trillion dollar capitalization of Facebook, in those two instances, that capital 
is entirely derived from this logic. Amazon comes on stream later, Microsoft comes on stream later, and now we've seen how successful this logic and the surveillance dividend has been for those companies. But let's move on because Natalie's question really points us into the direction of not only understanding this economic logic, very important to understand, this is an economic logic, it's not technology. We can deploy digital technologies in a thousand different ways. This is only one. So let's fast forward to some of its social consequences because that brings us to the question that we're all here to discuss, which is rights. When you are a company and you are competing on selling predictions of human behavior, you're selling human futures, which is to say you are selling certainty. There are three things that you need to be successful in that competition. One, you need a lot of data, everything. Natalie gave you a sense of that. I call that economies of scale. These data capturing uh, supply chain interfaces, which began online when you're you know, browsing and searching and so forth, posting something on Facebook, they now extend through every domain of human life. It's your home, it's your car, it's your walk in the park, it's your bloodstream, it's your thoughts. Okay. They also need varieties of data. So volume, and which is scale, and varieties, which is scope. It's not just enough to have what we're doing online. They want to have our feelings, our emotions, our, the state of our health, um, they take these things from, for example, the stoop of our shoulders when they take us walking down the street. They take them from the hundreds of facial gestures that they get out of facial recognition and a thousand other ways. So they need scale and they need scope. Then they made an extraordinary discovery. The most predictive data comes from actually interfacing with us, touching our behavior and learning how to tune us to hurt us, to actually modify our behavior in the direction that optimizes their revenue flows. There are many examples of this. I won't go into all of them now because we have a lot of time to talk. But let's just say that when you talk about Facebook's uh, social contagion experiments, when you talk about Google's uh, augmented reality game that we know as Pokemon Go, these were early phases of experimentation and how exactly do you use subliminal cues, social comparison dynamics, rewards and punishments, the structures of gamification to learn, learn how to tune and herd individuals, groups, and populations at scale. The question we have to ask, what is this power to use digital instrumentation to have such control over human behavior at every level of the system. This is an extraordinary power. Now, all of us have tended to fall back on forms of power, theories of power, examples of power from the past. So we've called it digital totalitarianism, we've called it digital fascism, whatever, whatever. What I wanna stress is that taking old categories and trying to interpret this new power through those old categories has actually set us back from understanding what's going on. I call this new power instrumentarian power because it works exclusively through the milieu of digital instrumentation. This is not armies of jackbooted soldiers coming to drag us in the middle of the night to the gulag or the camp. This is not the threat of violence, terror, and murder, which was the signature of totalitarian power. This is a form of power that comes on slippered feet. It comes more likely offering us a cappuccino and just the way we know you like it. But it is a power based on an increasingly ubiquitous, pervasive digital infrastructure that has been commandeered by this economic logic to shape our behavior in, the, in, in a way that is aligned with its interests. And it is radically indifferent to everything else. 
which is to say radically indifferent to our actual needs, our state of well-being, and the needs of our societies. An instrumentarian society is a vision of the long game of surveillance capitalism, where private, unaccountable instrumentarian power replaces democracy as the arbiter of social order. That is the end game of this work. That is the end game of this economic logic. And that is why it has mobilized me for so many years to tell this story. And that is why my greatest wish is that we all spread this knowledge and work together now to mobilize for the third decade. Thank you for that, Shoshana. Uh, so as, as I think uh, Shoshana has given us a really good sense, um, the logic of surveillance capitalism is a, is a global economic logic. Um, but like all global uh, economic logics, it, uh, it affects uh, each of us and each of our communities in different ways, uh, depending on where we are situated. Uh, so I'd like to turn to, uh, to, to a specific US example. Um, you know, as, as is always the case, uh, and again, especially in the US, uh, surveillance and control are experienced differently uh, by uh, people who are uh, not the dominant uh, group uh, or the, the most powerful group in society. And so in this case, we're talking specifically uh, about Black, immigrant, LGBTQ, um, a, a range of uh, groups in the US that have been marginalized over time. Uh, so Chris, uh, let's turn to you for a sense of that history, both before the rise of surveillance capitalism, since surveillance itself does predate, of course, uh, surveillance capitalism, uh, and since uh, the early 2000s. And I'll note for our audience, um, that like many of us, uh, Chris uh, has uh, is strongly committed to his personal privacy. And uh, one of the choices that he's making for himself is to keep his face off the internet uh, as much as possible. So uh, you'll be hearing uh, Chris, but via only, only uh, uh, audio only. Oh, thank you, Natalie. Um, and so, well, I wanna, first of all, thank you, Shoshana as well. Um, but I wanna start and and say that a lot of my work, a lot of um, how I've come to these understandings is built on the work of some other amazing scholars, um, Simone Brown, Virginia Eubanks, uh, Sophia Noble, Ruha Benjamin. Uh, and I just want to start with something that Simone said um, in her book, Dark Matters, which is that the historical formation of surveillance is not outside the historical formation of slavery. And, and how I understand that is that it's, um, particularly, particularly for uh, enslaved, formerly enslaved peoples, um, but also as we move forward to think about um, other marginalized groups, populations, uh, as you mentioned, Natalie, um, whether that's who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, um, you know, people who are experiencing economic stress, um, you know, trans folks, um, typically experience are, are not unfamiliar with. Um, wide uh, variety of surveillance practices, um, both by um, you know, the government, by law enforcement, but by companies as well. But the other part of that, I think that's really important to note and to always pay attention to um, in these kind of discussions is the harms that these groups experience typically come first and are often uh, much more um, serious and, and, and harmful early on. Um, and so in a lot of ways, these the, the uh, mechanisms or the, the problems that um, Shoshana mentioned, um, I don't, don't want to take away from any of those at all. But uh, historically, a lot of that falls on um, marginalized populations uh, sooner and, and more and more harshly. And I think that's something to pay attention to. 
Well, that's embarrassing. I was on mute this whole time. <laughs> uh, I was saying uh, that, um, well, first of all, we're all still getting used to this clearly, um, but also I wanted to turn uh, to Joe, who's with Amnesty International, uh, for, to, to, for a sense of how uh, the surveillance capitalism framework as developed by Shoshana, as well as other uh, scholarship on, uh, on surveillance, uh, including work by, uh, by the scholars that, that, that Chris mentioned, as well as others, uh, how this has impacted uh, activism for Joe and for Amnesty, uh, but also uh, what, what influence we've seen in the, in the movement more broadly. And thanks so much, Shoshana and Chris, um, for all of your uh, work on this area. Um, I mean, for, for Amnesty, I think uh, Shoshana's book and all of the other work that has been done on uh, uncovering the uh, problems of surveillance capitalism really made us focus on the root causes of so many of the problems that we're seeing with technology and human rights. And I think we now, as Amnesty, see surveillance capitalism as one of the biggest human rights challenges of our time. As Shoshana has said previously, climate change is to the planet what surveillance capitalism is to society. And um, I think just like with climate change, as Chris just articulated just now, uh, the harms aren't going to be felt equally. Systems of surveillance disproportionately impact people based on, on race, class, socioeconomic background and, and uh, other you know, marginalised groups in society. And we're already seeing that. Um, so really, Amnesty sees this as a, a long-term programme of work for the future, um, and the report that we published last year called Surveillance Giants really just laid the groundwork for why we consider this business model based on surveillance inherently as a threat to human rights. So just to super briefly summarise our, our arguments, I mean, I think, as Shoshana kind of set out, really, you know, this... The, the business model is, is the opposite of privacy, undermining the, the very essence of privacy. But I think it also you know, has this knock-on effect on a whole range of other human rights, including non-discrimination, freedom of expression, even freedom of thought, through the way that it gives um, tech companies and others the, the power to shape and control our information environments and influence our thoughts and behaviours, as well as incentivizing the platforms to amplify racism, hate, speech, misinformation. And this is, you know, these are collective harms to society, not just individual harms. And time and again, we've seen governments and other actors weaponize the same architecture of surveillance and control. And there seem to now be almost daily examples of how this is really impacting on people's lives um, all around the world. Um, but uh, so as Shoshana said, this is an economic logic that goes far beyond uh, just individual companies, but we have so far focused on, uh, in particular on Google and Facebook, not just as pioneers of this model, but also because of their dominance over the kind of global public square through the, the controlling the channels we rely on to engage with the digital world, search, social media, messaging, video, smartphones. And, you know, it is, um, the, the power of the platforms over this you know, pervasive digital infrastructure, as, as Shoshana said, um, that goes hand in hand with the rights and bats. Um, so one of our key arguments is that, you know, it's, it's well established that access to the internet is a critical enabler of human rights. But in practice, it's now virtually impossible to engage with the digital world without coming under this, um, architecture of surveillance and control which forces people into this paradoxical situation where they're only able to enjoy their human rights online by submitting to a system predicated on human rights abuse um, and i think you know just finally um this power has also created this enormous accountability gap you know 10 years ago john ruggie said that the underlying problem of business human rights was governance gaps between the scope and impact of economic forces and actors and the capacity of societies to manage their adverse consequences. I cannot think of a wider governance gap than that between um, big tech and the surveillance capitalists and the inability of, of societies to hold them to account. Um, so I think for human rights activism in the future, we need to you know, 
continue to try to hold them to account for harms in specific contexts, but also keep in mind the need to radically overhaul the system itself. Um, but Natalie, I know you've done a lot to analyze this issue as well using the human rights framework. So maybe what, you know, if you could talk about your the main findings and recommendations from your work. I thought I was asking the questions here, Joe. Um, nonetheless, thanks for the question. So uh, ranking digital rights, as many of you, of you all know, uh, for the past uh, couple of years has been working to overhaul uh, the methodology behind the RDR Corporate Accountability Index to account for some of the harms uh, that we see as directly related to, uh, to surveillance capitalism. Uh, and the two areas uh, that we're focusing on is accountability uh, for targeted advertising uh, itself and uh, also for transparency and accountability uh, for the algorithmic content governance systems uh, that social media platforms in particular use to determine uh, what we see, what we hear, what we watch, uh, and, and therefore uh, nudge our, our behavior in, um, in ways that ultimately benefit them. Uh, and one of the most recent outcomes of that area of work uh, was the It's the Business Model Report series uh, that you can find uh, on our website, uh, rankingdigitalrights.org. Uh, and of course, you can stay tuned for, uh, for February for the release of the next Corporate Accountability Index, where we'll have some data on, on what companies uh, do and say they do uh, in those two areas that I outlined. Um, so Shoshana, um, what should we do about all this? Uh, you know, we've been talking about the problems, uh, but what should we actually do about it? Uh, I'm sure you have some thoughts. Let me let me mention a couple of, of principles for action and then talk about some of the, the specific directions that uh, we need to move in. Uh, one principle is that um, we're in a, a, a long game. I used the term long game before when talking about the surveillance capitalists and their, you know, their very grand aims, not only for the, the growth of their empires, but that their empires will eventually displace uh, democratic governance, dis displace the social order as we know it. Um, that may sound a little fantastical, a little science fiction-y, but um, uh, I've been, had my head in this for long enough to persuade myself that that is not at all science fiction-y, unfortunately. Um, so, so we're talking about thinking in terms of decades, Natalie. This is the first thing. Uh, thinking in terms of decades means that you know these the first two decades of the 21st century uh, have been essentially gifted to surveillance capitalists. There has been almost no law to repel their action, to constrain their stealing. Uh, on the contrary, uh, there have been arrangements uh, largely born of 9-11. What's that? Largely born of 9-11 that, um, that have created this a convergence of interests between government and the, and the growth and the power of the tech companies. And, and now we're kind of, you know, eating this uh, rotten lunch that, that we've set the table for for, for two decades. So my view is that we've got the next decade to really get serious about turning this around. It's not gonna be one legislative cycle. It's not gonna be one big idea. We've gotta think about new charters of rights. We've gotta think about new legal frameworks. We have to think about different regulatory paradigms and we have to think about new institutional forms. All of those are going to be necessary in this next, next decade. Three of the biggest problems when people try to do something here. Number one, they focus on effects, not causes. The effects are very important, but unless we get to causes, those effects are gonna come back and back and back. Example, we're focused on disinformation, rightly so, because it is like a, a knife just you know hatch, hatching its way through our, our democracies and through our social order. But 
we can't just focus on disinformation because it's an effect. It's an effect of the economic logic we've been talking about. We've got to get to the mechanisms that incentivize practices that produce disinformation. If we don't do that, we're just chasing our tail in a kind of rhetorical arms race with people like Mark Zuckerberg and look where that's getting us. So um, we also have to understand that we're not talking about one company. We're not even only talking about the tech sector. Right now, the same economic logic has spread across every aspect of the normal economy. So we've got to think in terms of what are the, you know, the, the sort of dominant uh, paradigms, economic paradigms that are producing wealth in our society. And we have to intervene in those in order to both interrupt and criminalize those key mechanisms and, and methods. Um, and the, the, the third thing I would add is that we have to be mindful that this trajectory that we're on toward the digital future right now is being authored in the West by surveillance capitalism. In, the, uh, in countries like China and in other authoritarian countries, um, what we see is a kind of merging of the authoritarian state with these instrumentarian powers. And increasingly, uh, we see those, those very same kinds of convergences occurring here uh, in the West and in the US. Um, this is very dangerous and we, we need to be able to, to constantly tease apart what state, what's market, and where are the levers of change. So um, what do we do? Um, in the year 2020, we face a very different reality than we did in the year 2001 uh, when the Twin Towers were hit, which also coincidentally was the year that surveillance capitalism was first discovered at Google, invented at Google. All right. Um, back then, we were talking about baby companies. Um, right now, we're talking about information empires. These are two very distinct time frames, very distinct conditions of existence. We have lawmakers now around the world who are beginning to mobilize. When those lawmakers go to work every day in the EU, um, in the European Commission, um, in the UK uh, Houses of Parliament, um, and in the United States Congress, in the House and in the Senate, when they go to work every day, the people who are ringing their phones and knocking on their doors are the lobbyists for surveillance capitalism. We need to change that. That means we need to organize. We are no longer users. That's a name that they gave us, an anonymous, global, undifferentiated group whose only identity derives from our relationship to their machines. We are no longer users. We need to think of ourselves as democratic citizens facing intolerable conditions that in a democratic society, we should never be asked to face. The fact that Chris cannot share his face on the internet, the fact that our, our families and our friends and our children are out protesting, wearing masks, not to protect themselves from predators, not to protect themselves from a pandemic, but to protect themselves from surveillance systems, public and private, in this new convergence and collaboration. That is an intolerable situation that is fundamentally incompatible with democracy. So we need to organize the way people have organized throughout the ages in the civil rights movement, in the union movement. And what we call our organizations and how we collaborate and the content of what we want to achieve, those things will be different and they will be specific to our material moment, our moment in history. But lawmakers need to feel that we are pressing them at their backs, that we will not, we will not, um, um, we will not uh, in any way 
stop mobilizing. We will not in any way let up the pressure. We will not in any way release. So this is the work that, that the kind of work that amnesty can do. And it's creating um, um, collaborations across the key activist groups around the world who, who already have hubs available around which we can mobilize into new kinds of chapters and networks and systems. Um, so, so this is one of the key things. At the other end of the spectrum, we have to be thinking about law in a different way. If we're going to mobilize and put a fundamentally new level of pressure on our lawmakers, we have to have things for them to do that are going to cut to the heart of this situation. Right now, they're, you know, they're, they're in Congress talking about antitrust. There's nothing wrong with talking about antitrust. And in some cases, making some of these empires smaller uh, will actually um, be productive. In some cases, it won't be. But we have to be working toward new kinds of laws that interrupt and criminalize the new mechanisms, the mechanisms that were invented in the 20th century, the mechanisms that do not pertain to monopoly as we know it. And let me give you two examples. Right now, these companies have fought for the right to take our bodies, our faces, our experience, wherever they can get it. They have fought for the right to use hidden mechanisms that are engineered with a great deal of skill and capital to bypass our awareness, to be hidden, ergo the word surveillance capitalism. If these mechanisms were out in the open, they could not, um, they could not produce these uh, global supply chains full of data flows that they have. They could not produce the AI that they have, whereas we know about uh, Facebook's AI hub, trillions of data points crunched every day, six million predictions of human behavior produced every second, right? So if these systems were out in the open, that simply would not be possible scale and scope, let alone action. Okay, so we have to uh, come backward from this activity. Virtually everything that we've done is about data protection, data privacy, data portability, data rights. Everything begins with data. If we begin with data, we have already lost this struggle. Data means the horse is out of the barn. Data means they've already taken our faces and translated them into data for facial recognition systems and everything else. We have to come before data. And this begins with a new charter of fundamental rights that asks who gets to know about my experience? This is what I call epistemic rights. Who knows? Who decides who knows? Knowledge, authority. Who decides who decides who knows? Knowledge, authority, and power. These fundamental rights, which have always been considered inalienable, they've always been considered elemental, just like before we had a juridical right to freedom of speech, a constitutional right to freedom of speech, no money was going around saying, hey, I need a right to speak. If you're healthy and your lungs and everything work, you can open your mouth and you can speak. You didn't need a right. This was something elemental. It was only when society achieved that state of complexity and political density where some people wanted to stop the voices of other people that we had to have a right to free speech. That is a certain moment in history when elemental rights converge with political power. We are at that moment now when it comes to epistemic rights. They have no right to know my face, to know about my emotions from what they can read in my face, from what their systems can tell about my, 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 uh, my feelings, my fears, and uh, my anticipations for my immediate future. So we have to get back to the elemental rights, I am the one who gets to know my experience. 
and I am the one who decides who knows. And uh, all of that happens under the rubric of the rule of law and democratic governance. So coming back to this deeper level of rights is, Natalie, um, one of the key places we have to start. Final point, on the other end of the spectrum of this logic, remember the logic begins with taking our experience, translating it into data, I'm contesting that, but it ends with selling predictions about us into human futures markets. I want to say that human futures markets need to be criminalized. They need to be made illegal. They cannot stand. Human futures markets have predictably anti-democratic consequences. Those consequences are already clear. The economic imperatives of surveillance capitalism are a direct result of the financial incentives in those markets. Uh, we will have information empires trying to know and control human behavior as long as their revenue flows depend on their sales of certainty into those markets. We have outlawed other kinds of markets uh, in our civilization. We have outlawed slave markets. We have outlawed markets that uh, sell babies. We have outlawed markets that sell human organs. These human futures markets are also pernicious, violent, and regularly, inevitably undermine democracy to the point that uh, they are um, fundamentally incompatible with democracy. So here are two ideas for how we begin to intervene in the foundations with rights and how we begin to criminalize, to outlaw key mechanisms and financial incentives that drive this logic. People will ask, wait a minute, does that mean I'm no longer be, gonna be able to have you know, search? <laughs> does that mean I'm no longer, or longer gonna be able to have a social network? And let me just close on this one point. We will have all of that because that belongs to the digital. And once we um, eliminate the surveillance dividend from the economic landscape, we will have thousands of tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs and technologists and designers and, and all kinds of people who wanna come on stream and take digital technology and put it to work for people and society without the anti-democratic, violent and dangerous in their own way, externalities of instrumentarian power and anti-democracy uh, that we buy every time we engage with a smart product, a personalized service, a supply chain interface of surveillance capitalism. All of that new competition, new capability is out there, but it's out there in a way that is ready to be designed on our terms, on the terms of a democratic future. Thank you very much, Shoshana. It certainly sounds like we have a lot of work to do over the next decade and, and possibly beyond. Um, Joe, what, what do you see as some of the most active efforts by activists and advocates to tackle this system of surveillance capitalism right now? And how well do these efforts align with what Shoshana just, just lined out? Thanks. Well, I mean, I think, as Shoshana said, you know, it's creating these, these connections and these collaborations across all the different movements kind of working in this space and I, you know i don't pretend to speak to all the amazing work that's already happening um but uh, i can highlight a few interesting examples of, of relevant work that i'm seeing i mean i think obviously the digital rights and privacy movement have, have been warning about this for years and in some cases decades i think it's interesting how it's increasingly involving wider and wider and more diverse sets of groups at national regional local levels i mean i think obviously you know, it, the very current example is the the um, civil rights and racial justice organizations leading the campaign on Facebook to stop hate for profit, linking it to the fight against structural racism. Um, I think it's interesting to see consumer rights groups um, being really active on this area, like the work of the Norwegian uh, 
Consumer Council on ad tech. Um, competition law is obviously one lever that, as Shoshana mentioned, and there's um, Privacy International and others campaigning to challenge the Google Fitbit merger. Um, the, I think strategic litigation will be vital, um, like the work of Max Schrems organization um, and others in Europe. Um, I think connecting with, with global movements, I think is, is also going to be a huge priority for the future. You know, this is from a few years ago, but Indian activists succeeded in blocking Facebook's free basics in the country um, a few years ago. Um, and then I think at the local level, that's also where there's the, it's really interesting to see um, campaigns and activism like the um, success of activists stopping Alphabet's um, Cyborg Toronto Smart City project, which Shoshana had previously called the new frontier of surveillance capitalism. Um, but of course, like connected to this, we'll need lots of advocacy um, to shape strong future state re regulation, like the work of many of the groups at Rights on, on, on um, things like the, the European Digital Services Act. But I think it is it's, it's quite exciting to see the, the opportunity to kind of pull all these strands together to create a kind of connected and diverse global movement working on, on these issues. right now in, in many respects, but specifically with respect to data surveillance and, serv and civil rights, uh, including Black Lives Matter and the Stop Hate for Profit campaign that Joe mentioned. How do you see the connection between today's civil rights movement and all of its manifestations and this fight to roll back surveillance capitalism? Well, I think um, it's really impossible to uh, separate or divorce policing, white supremacy, surveillance, and tech platforms. Uh, I think we can't really address one of them without addressing all of them. Uh, you know, and I, I think more and more people are coming to that realization. And so for instance, as people now across the United States, but also across the world are out in the streets um, fighting and advocating for their rights, uh, governments are deploying uh, surveillance planes and automated license plate readers, facial recognition. They're buying this information from uh, various companies and you know they're monitoring people's social media, whether they use Twitter or Facebook or, or WhatsApp. And so I think as more people come to the realization that these, these uh, systems are all intertwined, um, what we're seeing is a demand for uh, for this to be different, yeah, I'm so glad that Joe pointed out how these uh, systems are uh, collective harm, collectively harmful, and that Shoshana talks about uh, making some of these things illegal. Uh, I think that is a discussion uh, that's been a long time coming, but one I, I very much welcome, and I, I think is is really important. And so, where do you see uh, U.S. domestic activism going in the next two, five? 10 years, uh, what, where do you see uh, the most promising opportunities to counter the expansion of these architecture of surveillance, uh, including digital redlining, which I know is something that you've written a lot about? Yeah, so the thing I would say, again, just to, to connect back to uh, what uh, everyone else has said is one of the things that people are calling for in the US is, is abolishing the police. And I think it's it's kind of widely misunderstood, but uh, or maybe willfully so. But I, I think one of the important things to to take out of that is we've um, for so long we've been told, particularly the technology, that once something exists or once something's been invented, uh, for instance, facial recognition, that we can't control it or we have to accept the way it's been presented to us um, by platforms and technologists and things like that. I think one of the most important things that's coming out of Movement for Black Lives and the Stop Hate for Profit movement is a demand that these things stop, not a request. And the admission or the acknowledgement uh, and the popularization of the notion that some technology shouldn't exist, some technology should be illegal, some technology should not be deployed against uh, individuals or communities. 
and for so long, so that is the um, that is the thing that I, I I've seen um, become more and more present, and more uh, potent. Because even two years ago, when you would say, uh, "Well, facial recognition should be banned," or you know, um, something like that, people would were would widely ridicule you. Uh, and we're seeing now in lots of different cities and states across the country are doing just that. And so that that uh, belief in abolition and in stopping harmful tech in its tracks rather than negotiating with it, I think is a really important thing. So Joe, uh, what, what do you think, um, I guess, same question for you, but with respect to European and global priorities, uh, where do you see uh, activism going in the next two, five, 10 years? And what are, what are the most promising opportunities to, to, to push back? Well, I, th I mean, I think as an international organization, one of Amnesty's priorities is, is the need to um, look beyond Europe and the US and show how people's lives are impacted differently around the world. And I think to connect with movements in the global south to expose, you know, uh, how this is part of a, you know, what, what some people have called kind of digital colonialism, especially, especially in countries where, for example, Facebook is the Internet. Um, and I think the harms are going to be completely um, different and in some cases more severe. Um, I mean, I think another thing which I think is pertinent um, in the context of, of the pandemic is that we need to keep an eye on the expansion um, to health health care and biotech in particular. Um, I think that under the cover of the, the, the COVID crisis, that that's a real um, danger and something for activists to keep an eye on. Um, but I think, you know, going back to Shoshana's point, I think we need to continue calling out the harms in specific contexts, chipping away at the problem and campaigning for wins in the, in the short term. But we also need to keep this focus on overhauling the underlying structures, you know, looking for kind of um, seemingly radical proposals, like Chris was saying, um, you know, blocking particular pieces of tech or particular practices where where necessary and really trying to um, get, you know, cut to the heart of the problem. Because I do think it's, you know, fundamentally a challenge of governance and, and the governance gap, as I said. Um, you know, and Shoshana has set out how she thinks, that her, you know, her work is on defining these new epistemic rights. I think um, our institutions of governance Ha, you know, need to be updated to a certain extent to keep pace with the the kind of networked information economy. Um, but, you know, just finally, I think, obviously, as a human rights organisation, we think it's it's vital that we, we take a human rights-based um, approach. This is a global problem and human rights is, is an established international framework grounded in binding law. Um, but I think, you know, we also need to be frank, human rights itself has to evolve to keep pace with this, to capture, you know, these societal impacts and the collective harms, as well as the, the individual impacts. Thank you, Joe. Um, so Shoshana, in, in light of everything that you've observed over the past several years and, and, and what uh, Chris and Joe have, have shared with us, uh, do you see do you see room for for optimism here, or signs that we should be uh, optimistic that that we can do this? And uh, second part of the question: uh, what should what should be the priority for activists who are seeking to overhaul the system of surveillance capitalism and reimagine uh, the digital world? Well, I see nothing but cause for optimism. Uh, that may seem a little strange, but um, gosh, Natalie, you know, uh, five years ago, we couldn't have been having this conversation, even though the, the phenomena that we're talking about uh, were well entrenched five years ago. Uh, even uh, three years ago, this conversation would have been, um, uh, some, you know, something more on the, on the fringe things have changed and part of what has changed and i think that um both both chris and and joe were speaking to this is that um you know we've, we've got these these 
big companies, these huge information empires. Um, and um, we, we have been kind of mesmerized uh, by their messaging for many years. You know, we've been told uh, we're in a we're in a time of the democratization of knowledge and the empowerment of the individual, and uh, this was supposed to be the freest century of them all, and it's turned out to be the most threatened century of them all when it comes to freedom and democracy, when it com comes to human autonomy, agency, self determination, uh, but also when it comes to social equality because now we're seeing built on top of the extremities of, of economic inequality, which we, ha which we have been just torn apart by for the last four to five decades uh, and are only you know, hoping <laughs> to be able to get to a point where we can now finally firmly reverse that course. Uh, we're seeing a new axis of social inequality imposed on top of that, which is epistemic inequality, that um, uh, the gap between what I can know and what can be known about me, the gap between what I can do and what can be done to me. Uh, and so, so these things are widening. We have been the victims of kind of universal gaslighting, these rhetorical strategies that have been used to tell us all, everything is inevitable. This is the way that digital works. Um, and uh, just lay back and enjoy it. This is the future and this is democratization. We have come to understand that this is not democratization and that none of this is inevitable. And it's no small thing. In fact, it is the essential first step. This awakening, this awareness, this sense of, as Chris was alluding to, people who are now willing to stand up and say, no, I'm not negotiating with you about how many hours a day an eight-year-old works in the factory. I'm saying no child labor, period. And that's the kind of position we need to take when it comes to facial recognition. I'm not negotiating with you about what facial recognition may or may not be al allowed to do. I'm saying no facial recognition. I'm saying you cannot have my face. I'm saying you have no right to my face. So it's, it's this new awareness that to me is the necessary foundation for everything uh, that we are gonna build on. Um, I wanna pick up on something that Joe said maybe uh, to, to close out this thought. And that is, um, I can't stress enough, um, and, and Joe, was, um, Joe was talking about this, the way in which we are in a new phase of history. Our societies have undergone a massive structural reorganization, a massive structural transformation. Look, in the year 1986, I was, I was two years away from publishing my first book that I had worked on for a decade, Computerization in the Workplace, 1986. 1% of the world's information was stored in digital format. Even by 2002, a year after surveillance capitalism was invented, only 25% was stored in digital format. Um, uh, we quickly got to the, uh, the analog, the tipping point between uh, digital and analog, but it then, everything accelerates and by 2007, 97% of information was stored in uh, digital format. So this is, you know, in, this is in historical time, this is like an asteroid hitting the surface of the earth and changing everything in a, in a split second. Right? This is a fundamental societal trauma, changes everything, but the human pace, is a different pace. That's not to be mourned, that's to be celebrated. Democracy is slow because it's human. Uh, democracy is slow because it entails our uh, participation and our talking and our thinking and our discussing and coming together. But ultimately, democracy is what will turn this around. And I'm so delighted that Joe brought up Toronto uh, 
because that is, if there is ever a beacon of optimism, the folks in Toronto have gifted, at, gifted it to us because Sidewalk Labs, which is Google, which is Alphabet, they believed they had a slam dunk in Toronto, that all they had to do was literally dial it in, dial in their recipe for the instrumentarian city in Toronto, that they would take control, thank you very much, and everything would be very nice and pleasant for the citizens. And what they didn't reckon was that there were citizens who care about democracy and who stood up and who said, no, not in my city, not in any city. And ultimately it was those citizens and their grassroots movement and the way in which they could attract civil society organizations to them like Joe's, like the um, Canadian Civil Liberties Union uh, uh, up in Canada, um, and, and the way they could attract elected officials and lawmakers to them, uh, that Sidewalk Labs ended up, uh, you know, uh, just like sneaking out of town, rolling up their tents and sneaking out of town in the bed of night because democracy won. Nothing is inevitable. That's the message for all of us in this next decade. What a wonderful message to end on. Thank you so much. Uh, Shoshana Zuboff, Chris Gilliard, and Joe Westby. Thank you to RightsCon for putting this together. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's tuning in today or who may turn in later when, when this is made uh, available more broadly. We're all on Twitter. We all have books, reports, journal articles out. I won't, spe I won't uh, spell out our Twitter handles, uh, but check out the live, uh, the live tweeting at the at ranking rights handle, and you can find uh, ways to get in touch with us. Uh, through there. Thanks again, everyone, and uh, keep up the good fight. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I think I'm, I might be in a dip. Okay, there we are.